Good afternoon, everyone here. I, it's a pleasure to greet you all. I'm opening hearing number eight of the 185th period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, entitled Respect and Insurance of Human Rights before uh, the activities of production and tr trade companies of weapons in the Americas. It was uh, requested by the state of Mexico. I am Suardo Ramon, Ralon, the pre vice president of the commission. I am joined here by commissioners Rosemena de Troitinho, rapporteur for Mexico, commissioner Roberta Clark, and commissioner Carlos Bernal. I am also joined at this hearing by the executive assistant Sec secretary for monitoring, Ms. Pulido, the special rapporteur for economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights, Soledad Garcia Munoz, and the special rapporteur for freedom of expression, Pedro Vaca. I would like to greet the states of Mexico, Bolivia, and Paraguay, and the civil society. I would also like to um, explain how we have allotted the minutes of this hearing. The requesting state will have 21 minutes to present. After that, there will be 21 minutes for the civil society and the other participating states. They will all have three minutes each. After that, the commission will speak for up to 15 minutes. Then we will go back to the Mexican state for 14 minutes. And finally, we will listen to the states and organizations for 14 minutes. They will speak for two minutes each. Finally, the commission will wrap up for five minutes. Without further ado, we will start this hearing now. The state of Mexico has the floor for 21 minutes. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Distinguished commissioners, executive secretary, representatives of the civil society, ladies and gentlemen, the state of Mexico would like to thank the Inter-American Commission for this hearing since it is through these spaces for dialogue that the states and civil society organizations can share their experiences and good practices on how to improve the situation of human rights in our continent. The state of Mexico requested this hearing to show the negative impact of the negligent in, um, activities of uh, gun companies in the region. These gun companies continue to multiply their profits at the expense of thousands of lives, and they have no sort of obligations. Uh, and states cannot, states cannot allow for this to keep on happening. Even though these companies are at the liberty of trading their products, they must do so in due diligence preventing negative impacts on human rights, especially when their products are potentially harmful, as is the case of fire weapons. Because if these negligent practices uh, lead to uh, third parties being hurt, states have uh, an obligation to bring them to justice because it is through our uh, national laws that we must prevent this from happening. Commissioners, the rights to life and personal integrity that are part of Article 1 of the American Declaration and Articles 4 and 5 of the American Convention on Human Rights call for different actions by the states for their protection and warranty. And this can only be achieved if the states that are part of the OAS implement the necessary measures not only not to uh, violate these rights, but also to provide, to protect them from the interference of state or private stakeholders. Unfortunately, our region has witnessed the sad consequences of uh, violence 
one of the last uh, examples of that was the case of the Rob Duvaldi School in Texas in the US the negligent practices of the manufacturing companies have made it easier for private citizens to obtain these weapons. And joined with um, racist ideologists, that's the perfect recipe for the um, commission of violations uh, against human rights, as happened in El Paso, Texas in 2019. The Inter-American Commission for Human Rights has already discussed the negative effects of gun violence on the rights enshrined in the Declaration and the Convention. In its 167th period of sessions in 2018, for example, the Convention called for a hearing on the regulation of gun trade and social violence in the United States, where it addressed the negative impact of the lack of regulation and the high indexes of uh, gun violence. In its 174th period of session in, 19, in 2019, the commission held a hearing on the impact of gun violence in the US. It was summoned by civil society organizations. And one of the conclusions was that there's a growing number of persons who lose their lives or are injured because of gun violence. With this hearing, Mexico would like to follow up on these discussions and underline that the lack of regulation of gun trade in, in the US and their violence is a cancer that unfortunately has spread and continues to spread around the region in different dimensions and depending on very complex phenomena the states of our continent have faced the consequences of domestic and transnational crime, which becomes more serious because of gun trafficking. And this situation is expanded because of the negligence of key stakeholders in the industry. I'm talking about companies, gun manufacturers, when they do not establish mechanisms to bring down the illicit trafficking of their products. For example, today, before of this session, a hearing was held on the militarization of public security in Mexico. Mexico would like to point out that one of the main causes for the rise in the activity of the armed forces in fighting crime is the firepower of criminal organizations a firepower that is facilitated by gun manufacturers from the US whose only aim is to make economic profit at the expense of the violence caused by their products. The negative effects on the American society and the damage they inflict on millions of persons in Latin America, in particular, the right to personal integrity and life is evident. Commissioners, allow me to refer to the negative effects in my country because of the negligent practices of the gun manufacturing industry. I would like to say that in Mexico, guns can only be purchased from one distributor, one store, which is owned by the army. This store sells only 30 eight weapons a day to civilians. In 2013, only over 3,000 particular citizens in Mexico had a valid gun permit. And between 2013 and 2018, the government only issued 218 gun licenses. In the case of the US, between 1999 and 2004, when uh, assault guns were prohibited in that country, weapon control production dropped considerably. At the end of that prohibition, gun companies increased their production and sale of assault weapons, military weapons. For example, in 1990, before this ban, 74,000 rifles were uh, manufactured to be sold in the US. In 2006, two minutes after the um, end of the ban, the uh, um, 
number went to over 300,000 in 2016, over 2.3 million new weapons were sold, AR-15s, I mean, in the civilian market in the US. So out of these manufacturing numbers, every year over half a million weapons are trafficked from the US out of the guns that are recovered in crime scenes in Mexico or seized from international uh, criminal organizations, between 70 and 90% of them were trafficked from uh, the US. And because of the nature of guns, the damage is unfortunately measured in deaths between 1999 and 2004, when these uh, assault rifles were banned in the US, uh, crimes in Mexico uh, were brought down. In 2003, there were only 2,500 uh, killings with fire weapons. But after that, the homicide rate rose 45%. In the case of, um, of uh, security forces, the guns were used to kill at least 415 members of the National Guard and the local police and to injure to injure at least over 800 people. In 2019, fire guns were responsible for over 17,000 murders in my country. Mexico is the third country with the highest death toll in these kind of deaths. Now, according to the Institute of, for Economics and Peace, the economic impact of violence in uh, Mexico in 2019 was 21, affected 21% 21 of its GDP. Now, with yeah. regards to the migrant uh, movements uh, that are appear because of violence, it is calculated that over 250,000 Mexican citizens flew from their cities and the numbers were even higher in border cities where the violence was even more frequent. Now, just to give you an example of the fire capacity of organized crime, I will give you a couple of examples. On June 26, 2020, the chief of police of the city of Mexico was attacked and two of his uh, bodyguards and one civil citizen died. Between the gun, among the guns that were found, there were three Barrett uh, weapons, one Smith & Wesson gun, uh, 3.5 millimeter uh, Smith & Wesson, Wesson, and a Colt of 5.6 millimeters, all of them American-made. In another case, in September 2016, armed men shot down a helicopter that belonged to the um, Michoacan um, district attorneys from that belonged to the district attorney's office. The pilot died, and none of those wep the weapons that were used for this are sold in the Mexican market. Mexico argues that the inflow of weapons into our country and their illicit use is the foreseeable result of uh, the negligent activities of the um, manufacturers in the US because they know that they are manufacturing weapons for uh, the um, Mexican criminal organizations. In the news, we have seen over and over, as well as in government reports and revisions and uh, uh, reports by the UN, this, is, this has been seen over and over again. These weapons are always found on crime scenes, but in spite of all of this information, companies have not implemented any sort of um, policies to uh, limit the um, yeah. reach of their guns. They will sell anything to anyone who has a license in the US, regardless of the fact uh, that the buyers have a record in uh, illicit activities. And because of all of this, in August 2021, the Mexican government presented a civil sue for damages uh, or 
against several uh, gun manufacturers to uh, bring them to justice because of their negligent practices in the way they sell their weapons because they facilitate the illicit traffic of these products to Mexico. This is an additional effort of the Mexican government to stop the illicit, illicit, illicit inflow of guns from the US to Mexico. In this lawsuit, the companies are urged to create and implement standards to monitor their own distribution systems, to incorporate mechanisms to um, prevent the use of their weapons by non-authorized users and to focus on campaigns aimed at uh, stopping the illicit traffic of their products to my country. Uh, last September 2022, a judge reviewed the sue and gave the companies a motion to dismiss without actually looking at the issue. His argument was that the existing law, which gives them some immunities from civilian, uh, from civil suits, protected them. But this considers that there is a procedural obstacle that allows the judge to seat on this issue. Mexico will appeal this decision, questioning the fact that this immunity law is now being given extraterritorial jurisdiction and that the law is protecting these companies that end up having uh, consequences in our territory. This month, Mexico filed a second lawsuit against five gun manufacturers in Arizona, in the US, for the systematic selling of illicit, of, of weapons and the illicit traffic into Mexico by selling weapons to uh, persons who are a closely, uh, that are closely work with uh, gun traffickers. Ladies and gentlemen, the discussions that we have already held here and in other fora may serve as a basis to deal with uh, the gun violence in a region. But even though this issue has been addressed from a regulationary point of view, there still is a very important factor that has not been analyzed enough. I'm talking about the relationship between the lack of due diligence in the gun manufacturers and distributors and the responsibility on the negative consequences when um, in terms of the protection of human rights. This has been very important for public international law in the past few years, since 2011 in the UN, the uh, guiding principles on companies and rights were adopted, which consider the obligation of companies to have policies to identify, prevent, and mitigate the way in which they address their impact on human rights. And these principles are based on three main axes. The first one establishes the duty of states to protect citizens of the abuse of companies operating in their territories through public policies, but in particular, the implementation of uh, legal steps to allow others to um, prevent this abuse. The second one has to do with the due diligence that all companies must observe to uh, prevent and mitigate the negative consequences of their activities on human rights. And this also includes the responsibility on their activities or those that are directly linked to their operations, products, or services. That's the principle number 17. And thirdly, the relevance of having access to resources that allow for comprehensive reparation. So states have accepted that companies, and not only states, can be held accountable for human rights violations as a result of their activities. The Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights for the for human sorry for human rights in the UN also has a um, special task force on the um, activities of uh, trans.
national companies that can provide information on this issue. This group issued two documents that should be mentioned within the framework of this hearing. The first one is a notice on the responsibility of companies working in the gun sector, which recommends or which suggests companies to implement due diligence processes to identify the risks and negative impacts of the use of their products. And it recommends the state to ensure legal capacity to the victims of human rights violations um, so that they can be part of the legal efforts against these companies. The second document focuses on the influence of these companies on um, policy and regulations because these companies have are responsible for uh, providing reparations and should abstain from pressuring for a cease of judicial or extrajudicial proceedings to determine their responsibility in human rights violations. Finally, the commission in its reports on inter-American um, violation, uh, sorry, uh, principles says that uh, companies may influence the behavior of private citizens which might end up affecting uh, the enjoyment of human rights e and even the state influence might be meaningful since it's it has more effect on the behavior of these stakeholders. So the states of the regions, through these laws to impart justice, must seek to provide victims of violence generated by the lack of due diligence by weapon companies, legal protection established by the American Convention and uh, the uh, inter-American principles so that non-repetition guarantees are strengthened in our society. By view of the above, the OAS uh, actors are forced to, are under the obligation to provide these supplies to citizens, which must be in accordance to the law under the framework of each state to guarantee the free and full enjoyment of the rights recognized in inter-American system. During the process of investigation and, and judicial process, the victims of human rights violations and their family members must have opportunities to participate and be heard. As is very well known by this commission, the concern of Mexico, of Mexico over the violation of human rights is genuine as it has proved in previous uh, opportunities, but the upsurge in violence and the protection of human rights requires uh, joint efforts in the region. A higher firepower in organized crimes is key to be assessed, and it's, it requires the cooperation of all countries in which these organizations operate. Thank you very much to the state of Mexico. I'm sorry to interrupt, but in order for everyone to participate, we must give the floor to someone else. We will now go to the next part of this hearing, which is a 20 minutes period in which the states and civil society representatives may intervene for three minutes each. So I give the floor to the state of Bolivia for three minutes. Good morning, Mr. President, commissioners, uh, Executive Secretariat, representatives of states and civil society, good afternoon. We recognize that it's necessary that this topic at this hearing must be addressed as this has been approved in the in the OAS General Assembly in the resolution of international law in which it's six point on the guideline principles on business and human rights it reads that we must study responsibility in the matter of human rights on the part of companies that manufacture and trade weapons in the Americas. We cannot ignore the existing relationship between the trade of weapons and the increase of violence in our hemisphere. It's a contemporary issue 
related to human rights that threatens the fundamental rights of all human beings' life. Violence with weapons is a common tragedy that affects the lives of people in all around the world and causes more than 500 deaths per day. Unfortunately, violence with firearms affects speci specifically and disproportionately communities that are in vulnerable situations and marginalized groups of society. Also, it's uh, closely linked to uh, criminal organizations, the most dangerous ones in our societies, such as drug trafficking, human trafficking, and terrorism. Companies that manufacture and trade weapons must comply with due diligence processes so that the fruit of their trade does not violate human rights of citizens. Companies are highly responsible in the and the destiny of the weapons they manufacture, which is one of the main motives of violence against states. The lack of joint provisions that respect legal systems where weapons must be regulated is evident. It's necessary to take steps aimed at seeing the social responsibility that must be complied with by companies that manufacture weapons to avoid armed violence as a priority to safeguard human rights. States are under the obligation to protect human rights as much as possible to create a safe environment for the majority of the population, especially for persons that are considered vulnerable. A state that does not control adequately the possession and use of, fire, of firearms in a persistent situation of armed violence is not complying its obligations and to protect human rights. This is why we support uh, the position of the Mexican state and we show our concern so that because this is evidenced, I'm sorry, the audio is cut, is cut off. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we, you ran out of time. So now I give the floor to the state of Paraguay for three minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, what we just heard by the representative of Mexico and the representative of Bolivia is very, very interesting. I wanted to mention very uh, briefly that my delegation, first of all, thanks the organizers for this initiative, so for this initiative of having convened this hearing in this period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, because addressing the guarantee of human rights in the face of companies that manufacture and trade arms in the Americas is very key right now. We would like to mention that in our country we have several legal instruments to combat the uh, possession and trading, illicit training of weapons, both nationally and internationally or regionally. Paraguay is also a party state against the the trade of ammunition, explosives, and other related materials to weapons, and also of the Treaty of uh, Weapon Trade. And it, it, it seeks to comply with those commitments to respect the United Nations framework on small weapons as well. So against this backdrop, we would like to say that there is a law in Paraguay as regards armed fires, uh, firearms and accessories, which is aimed to uh, implement rules to classify different weapons and ammunition and to also uh, control permits, licenses, and to regulate and monitor, monitor the export, the trade, the manufacturing, the transportation, and national transportation and the trade of different materials of weapons. And also as regards uh, the manufacturing of fireworks, also different 
hunting uh, spaces and, and companies are regulated by this law. The law also determines the circumstances to seize different materials or weapons and the administrative and legal sanctions that may proceed. All of this with the aim of complying with the purposes that our legislation establishes. So in that sense, I would like to say that these functions are implemented by the Armed Forces uh, Direction uh, Department and administered by the National Police and the Na National Center to trace weapons and ammunition. So I see I ran out of time. So if I have extra time then uh, later on, I would like to share more ex more of my experience with this topic here. Thank you very much. I give the floor now to Mr. Jonathan Lowy of Global Action on, Glo on Gun Violence. You have the floor. Thank you. Honorable commissioners and member states, I, I'm Jonathan Lowy, president of Global Action on Gun Violence. For 25 years, I've fought to stop the illegal arms trade and push for best practices in the gun industry, representing families and governments in the US, Canada, and Mexico. GAGV engages in advocacy, and therefore, we and I are registered under the Foreign Agents Registration Act for Mexico. However, I'm an independent witness. My primary message here today is Im immunity leads to impunity. Lax US laws give the arms industry effective immunity from regulation and accountability that leads to impunity to supply the criminal gun market and infringe on human rights of people throughout the region. The criminal gun market is not unavoidable. It's the result of deliberate actions by private arms companies and lax laws that allow them. Dealers choose to sell guns to buyers they know are likely trafficking, and manufacturers choose to supply those dealers without condition or oversight. Mexico's lawsuits and press reports provide many examples of dealers selling large numbers of guns to obvious traffickers who supply criminals in Mexico the US, the Caribbean, and elsewhere. The US government authorizes these dealers to sell unlimited numbers of guns, even when they repeatedly violate gun laws. Manufacturers are allowed to sell military-style weapons and supply even the worst dealers. Over 20 years ago, the US Department of Justice called on the gun industry to stop supplying dealers that have a pattern of selling guns to criminals and straw purchases. The industry refused with no repercussions. In 2000, Smith & Wesson agreed with the US to institute safer practices. It then reneged with no repercussions. Since then, the arms industry has doubled down on assault weapon sales and practices that supply criminals, leading to increases of gun deaths in the US, Mexico, and other countries. The illegal arms trade causes a regional citizen security crisis and infringes on human rights, including the right to live. The US fails to prevent or investigate human rights violations or impose appropriate punishment. On the contrary, instead, the US provides effective immunity, which creates impunity for conduct that feeds human rights abuses. We respectfully request that the commission recommend that all states members enforce effective regulatory measures to combat the illegal gun trade and to prepare a report focusing on the human rights impacts of the illegal gun trafficking from the US. Global Action on Gun Violence stands ready to assist the commission in any way. Thank you. Thank you very much. We thank your comments and I give the floor to Castellanos from the Astor Institute. You have the floor. Go ahead. Thank you very much, commissioners, for this invitation today. My name is Leon Castellanos. I'm a researcher in international law at the Astor Institute in La Haye and in the Netherlands. 
as we have seen in previous interventions, armed violence in the region, but particularly in the United States, has become endemic. According to the latest data, there was more than 42,000 deaths related to firearms in that country in 2020, which is a record figure. At the same time, the United States is the greatest exporter of weapons in the world. And as previous uh, persons said, these weapons call death and destruction all throughout the region. So despite this, the manufacturers and distributors of weapons are immune in the face of legal processes in the United States and the judicial resources for victims have become highly deficient since it was approved in 2005, despite being designed to avoid this type of situation, the, the law has shielded many manufacturers for, uh, in, in, for their civil responsibility. This law hinders access to legal resources to which victims have access. Ro laws are regulatory fra frameworks that are hindering reparation for victims and their violation of their rights to life. And they could violate provisions as regards judicial protection contained in Articles 8 and 28 of the San Jose Pact, as well as state responsibilities described on the International Convention on Access to Justice. The non-reparation of this violation commits the, the responsibility of the United States and other states by virtue of the protection of human rights they should be enforcing. There, there is a right to file an effective uh, resource or appeal. All victims must have access to competent legal systems. There's also the obligation to provide legal resources when these are not available on the part of member states. The committee that hears this uh, agreement states that it's important to uh, remove laws such as the previously known, uh, previously mentioned to provide protection to victims. Thank you very much. Thank you. We also thank you for your comments. Now I give the floor to John Lindsay Pollan. You have the floor. Thank you very much for convening this hearing. I'm part of Stop Those Acts to Mexico. We research and advocate and cooperate with community associations to stop the inflow of weapons to Mexico and raise the voices of people affected by uh, armed violence. The manufacturers of firearms are responsible for the violence in Mexico in part and in other countries that violence that is exerted by the firearms that they manufacture for the negligent acts in the market without restricting the trade of military weapons and their opposition to any sort of regulations of that market. Also, the manufacturers and exporters of firearms play a key role in the exportation of arms to military and police groups that commit serious human rights violations or are in collusion with organized crime. This is specifically concerning for Mexico, specifically in permits, which are not presented before government institutions that are responsible to avoid the export of weapons in actors in, involved in human rights violations. For example, Sedena documents show that coal manufacturing was notified in February 2015 of the fact that hundreds of rifles they manufacture were uh, destined to police officers in Mexico. This only two months after public reports that show the same involvement of this 
persons in the disappearance of 43 students in Mexico. However, the certificate that was submitted to the State Department for the export of rifles named Serena as the final consumer, despite having seen that the rifles were uh, destined to police office. The State Department has said that the exporting companies do not have the capacity to monitor the final consumers of their weapons, but the United States governments can monitor this. There are many cases of human rights violations or collusion with organized crime on the part of military officers and police officers of Mexico and other countries, so it's key to implement mechanisms to identify final consumers and prohibit the use of arms by agencies involved in human rights violations. Thank you very much. Thank you. We thank you for your comments. Now we give the floor to Connect Us Brazil to Mr. Bruno Langier. You have the floor. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and Connect Us Direitos Humanos, who generously invited us to share some information about Brazil. I also want to salute the state representatives and my colleagues from civil society. Our current president has made during his term the most dramatic changes in weapons and ammunition regulation in Brazil, losing the control and allowing more than 1.2 million weapons to enter the market since 2019. Many of these changes break international commitments made by the Brazilian state, especially those related with marketing and tracing. The academic literature shows the fact of increasing uh, weapons on violent crime, accidents, and suicide. These effects are much more dramatic, as you know, in our region, but especially in Brazil, in where seven out of 10 homicides are committed with firearms, and that affects uh, disproportionately less vulnerable and black communities and enhance the lethality of the gender-based violence. Our claim here is straightforward. Uh, the state's parties intensify the due diligence in each request for arms transfers to Brazil, a country that repeatedly shows human rights violation. So the past institute has produced a report with a list of these violations and also pointing the participation of foreign weapons, where US firearms play an important role. The decision of companies and countries for selling weapons for armed force or law enforcement agents should consider at least two questions. Has the institutions been involved in human rights violation in the last years? How well are the physical security and stockpile manage management of those institutions? Our report shows a lot of the derivations from state weapons ending in hands of the organized crime. Last but not least, it's important to report that this lack of control promoted by the Brazilian government does not only affect public security and organized crime, but has recently been engaging, endangering the existence of democracy, free elections, and free press in Brazil. Two days ago, a former congressperson and a known ally of President Bolsonaro, after violating his house arrest terms, threw grenades and shot 50 times with an assault rifle manufactured and imported from the US, uh, shot federal police agencies, two of them were injured. The threat is real and brings additional responsibility to states, parties in engaging to the Brazilian government and transferring firearms and ammunition to our territory. Our solidarity to the judicial demand by Mexican state against US manufacturers and thanks to the commission for promoting this audience. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Los comentarios. Le traslado la palabra. Thank you very much for your comments. Now we will give the floor to Montserrat Martinez Telles from Global Toast. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to thank the Commission for their invitation to take part in this hearing. I am the coordinator uh, at uh, Global Thought, a civil society organization in Mexico. The mechanisms of due diligence in human rights are fundamental to regulate the uh, purchasing of gun, of guns, of fire guns. And human rights standards must be applied not only to the exports, but only to the sales and national acquisitions by states and private companies. Due diligence processes must also be uh, implemented by the private sector, including financial institutions like banks, for example. 
and also transportation companies involved in gun uh, trade. Good practices and recommendations for the implementation of due diligence standards can be found in the guiding principles on companies and uh, human rights of the UN and also the report on the um, report issued by the uh, rapporteurship of the for uh, ESCE rights of the commission. Nevertheless, the implementation of all these instruments uh, must be implemented nationally. So it it's up to each state to implement them and to assess human rights violations when they make their decisions. It is up to the states to develop net regulationary frameworks so that they can uh, that uh, companies might comply with. So this is a challenge for the articulation of uh, international and national operations and all things that have to do with mitigating the risk of human rights violations. One of the issues that generate more most concern to uh, gun exporting states is giving the um, other states uh, the ability to respond to um, issues that might affect uh, national security. That is the dynamic that takes place. Now, what is the role of states to, um, how, sorry, how can the states assess the risks here when they are also stakeholders? What are the safeguards states should have to prevent illicit trafficking? And what is the um, responsibility of the private sector here? So we would like to ask the commission to consider the necessary guidelines to provide guidance in terms of the accountability of the private sector in the facilitating of uh, gun weapons, of, sorry, gun of guns and the role of the states in uh, regulating their uh, trafficking, the ring regulating their trade, sorry. Thank you very much. This is the end of the um, participation of the state and the representatives. Now we will move on to the questions or comments by the commission. I would like to give the floor to Commissioner Arosemena de Troitinho, Mexico's rapporteur. Do you have any comments or questions, ma'am? Thank you, President of this hearing, Commissioner Stuardo Rallon. I would like to greet everyone here. First of all, I would like to thank everyone for this opportunity that the state of Mexico has given us and for the support of other countries in the region. Because they are bringing the issue of human rights to this relationship between with the responsibility of private companies private companies that, of course, we are talking about gun manufacturers and how this is connected to the protection of the human rights of the populations in our countries. So this is a very important discussion and I would like to um, point out, we are joined today by our ESCR uh, rights rapporteur. And when we were working with Redesca in promoting a thematic report on human rights and private companies, the idea was this one in particular. What's the responsibility of the states, first and foremost, the states that are undergoing a situation of violence in the uh, use of gun, of fire guns. When I hear the figures of homicides by fire guns, we see the seriousness of the situation, but this brings us to a regional outlook on this issue. And I would like to point out that the 
commission, as Ms. Montserrat said, sorry, the, the, the commission has a very important role in promoting our inter-American standards. There's a whole series of guiding principles, but the commission, of course, has worked on identifying the realities in our region. And one of my questions would be, how are the states working on these responsibilities to ask companies in their countries who will be working with gun manufacturers, of course, but what are the measures the states should implement and what are they already doing to uh, have a more of a control of the situation. We have heard that in Mexico, that Mexico has filed civil lawsuits in the US and um, we have heard about the obstacles in the territorial jurisdiction. But what can we do about those realities in our countries to control these companies' due diligence? If the manufacturer's country is not subjecting them to a responsibility, we in our countries have the responsibility to address the operations of those companies within our territories to ensure the protection of people's lives. So I think I would like to know how the states see the hurdles they face in imposing the controls they need to impose to make sure that we are implementing our inter-American uh, standards. And I'm sorry, Redesca, but I will, um, I will ask you to, to speak about this as well, because the commission is at everyone's disposal. So it would be wonderful to take a report on companies and uh, human rights and translate it into a relationship with the states and the civil society. But well, I would just like to thank you for this wonderful opportunity to receive such important information. Thank you very much, Madam Commissioner. We don't have much time, but I would like to ask my colleagues, Commissioner Clark, do you would you like to say anything or do you have any questions? Thank you very much, Commissioner Alon. I, I have quite a lot to say, but I know we don't have the time. I want to certainly thank the representatives of the states from Mexico and Bolivia and Paraguay, as well as the human rights defenders and the civil society organizations who are here with us today. I mean, what you have, what we are speaking about here amounts to the egregious harm, egregious and unregulated harm that's taking place everywhere in the region. And I'm, I'm uh, here in the Zoom call from the Caribbean, small island development states that are many of some of them are swamped by the um, availability of, of illegal weapons coming through porous borders. So I certainly understand what you're saying. Um, and also that these uh, weapons, assault weapons, militarized weapons, small arms, whatever they look like, grenades, I think we've heard today, uh, are associated with uh, the, the, the control of these uh, weapons in them in and of itself is a crime, but also allows for the perpetration of very serious crimes, trafficking in persons we've heard, tra drug trafficking, terrorism, but also the destabilization of democracies, which I think you know is so very critical, and also the undermining of citizen security. And I, I very much agree with those of you who have said that the citizen insecurity is very much felt. felt by the most marginalized populations, those most discriminated against. And it's really also very much connected to, to, to people living in, in situations of extreme poverty. So all of that, 
I think we understand and we agree with. Um, and I think that, of course, a regional approach is needed, particularly when there's less than political will to regulate the manufacture of, 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 of arms and ammunition, as well as the, um, the distribution of that. So I think a regional approach is really important and it's a regional approach, which is a political approach drawing on the human rights standards. I really just have one question. And I think this is a, a conversation that we could have, we could keep going with, but I'm interested in your use of your language, the use of the language of negligence Several of you all have spoken about the negligence of arms manufacturers and arms dealers, um, which that language is a kind of soft language suggesting that they should do something, but they're not doing it, as opposed to what feels seems more like, as you describe the scenarios, seems more like a recklessness. So deliberately engaging in dangerous conduct, knowing that harm is very likely because of your conduct. And so I'm just wondering, and I know that you all are all lawyers, so you're using language very carefully. So I wanted to just sort of think that through with you, um, because I think it does it does sort of shape the kind of articulation that we may want to have around uh, the the obligations of states and also the obligation of the multi multilateral system to deal with these cross border issues. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, comisionada Clark. Y le pregunto al comisionado, al comisionado Bernal si tiene alguna pregunta. Uh, I would like to ask Commissioner Bernal if he has any questions. No, thank you, Mr. President. Voy a a la... Now I would like to si tiene algún comentario. ask the rapporteur for ESE Rights if she has any comments. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I would like to thank all the states that are here today and the commission as well. I have a lot to say, as Commissioner Rosemena was saying, this is something that our uh, rapporteurship has been working on since its creation. We live in the most unequal and most dangerous region in the world. And that stems from the fact that it is very easy to access weapons. So. It is a transcendental issue for human rights in our region. And I think it's very important, as Commissioner Rosemena was saying, to point out that this is something that must be addressed with a regional perspective and actually with an inter-American perspective, I would say. And the report that we drafted for the Commission on Inter-American Standards is particularly accurate and relevant here. For example, on that report, one of the inter-American uh, criteriums shown were the importance of extraterritoriality and how uh, the responsibility of a state that facilitates the export of those weapons or that uh, product that ends up affecting human rights. And I think we should analyze that, and we should also think of it in terms of due diligence, not only considering the guiding principles, in particular principle two that speaks about the due diligence of companies, but also the due diligence considering um, the inter-American situation of the states involved, the importing states and the exporting states, when we are talking about legal trade of weapons, this should all be analyzed. And of course, we are at everyone's disposal very gladly, Madam Commissioner, with uh, your rapporteurship for Mexico. We are always willing to work with you. But I have a question because we are talking about the responsibility of these companies. And currently, there's a very important negotiation going on on a binding treaty that has been discussed for years at the UN. And I would like to take the opportunity, because we have three states in the region that are here, so I would like you to tell us about your perspective on this binding treaty being discussed right now. Thank you, Madam President, Mr. President. Thank you. 
Thank you, Madam Rapporteur. And I would like to ask Mr. Pedro Vaca if he has any questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Commissioner. I would like to greet everyone here in this hearing. I have learned so much at this hearing and I would just like to say, to bring quite discouraging news for the region, 2022 has been the uh, most lethal year for the press so far in our continent. And this makes me think that if we ask the states to prevent the attacks on the press and to fight the impunity uh, of these attacks, there are certain conditions that might facilitate this. So I think that this is a very pertinent conversation. Our you can count on our rapporteurship for any elements you need in terms of traceability, for example, um, as my colleague uh, Soledad Garcia Munoz said, and of course you have our empathy because we wish our continent to um, solve this issue so that the press can feel safe in their work in our region. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I would also like to thank the comments presented today. And I would just like to make a comment and ask a question. Commissioner Clark asked a very interesting question, I believe, which has to do with uh, negligence versus due diligence and how to address this and how to use these terms accurately. And I think that there should be um, regulation that allows us to um, see how responsibilities are um, pointed out because there's a stage where the state has its due diligence, it should be um, following the uh, trade of the weapons. But after that, there's a different optics with regards to due diligence about how the state uses them as it should so that we won't see situations where these weapons end up at the hands of certain units when there's no full traceability. Just a little comment about that. I also have a question. Are there any good practices in terms of regulations and control with regards to the accountability here or have no good practices been identified yet. Thank you very much. And after that, uh, with this, we wrap up the intervention of the commission and we will now move on to the next part of the hearing that has to do with giving the state of Mexico 14 minutes to answer some to some of the comments that have been made here. You have the floor. Thank you very much, commissioners, for your questions and your comments. It's a pity that the United States uh, representatives are not here because they could have much more uh, answers as of what a state could do to avoid uh, having their products damaging and entering persons in the region. There are specialists that that truly know the United States and the legal system as regards the weapon trade, which could uh, intervene in this hearing. So let me start by answering your questions by underscoring a very important uh, distinction. We have a legal trade, legal exchanges the Mexican state through its armed forces and the National Defense Secretariat purchasing weapons. That is a legal market. Those weapons are then distributed to the to the law enforcement officials. As any state, we must address that as well, but that is such a, an, it's not a complex issue in comparison with the other issue. There is a series of commitments and the state of Mexico is part of the uh, agreement on weapon exchange. For example, in the case of the German uh, state, they are very comfortable as, as uh, very 
specific as regards the final destination of their weapons are they uh, impose sanctions when their weapons are used for human rights violations. That is something we could delve deeper into later on. But the greatest problem right now is the illicit, the illegal trade of weapons. That is legal trade in the United States that then becomes illegal and reaches Mexico. So it's important to underscore that in Mexico, there's only one sales point administered by the armed uh, forces, while in the United States there are more than 20,000 sale points, if not more, and many, many of them, hundreds of them, are on the borderline with Mexico. We are dim we are seeing a case uh, less than 100 kilometers away from the border of Mexico, so it's clear that they are feeding criminal organizations in my my country and there is their negligence we use this term because this is how we used it in this civil uh case but of course it's a complete complicity collusion but negligence lies in the fact that no knowing or knowing that their product will end up in the hands of criminals or people who injure or infringe human rights they do not do anything to prevent this and companies know this in the united states i mean the illegal trade of weapons as regards government reports or information by specialized uh, bodies news academic reports even the videos uploaded by criminal organizations showing their firepower companies are under under the warning they they truly know that their weapons are not uh, inside their country they are purchased by criminals in a transaction that is legal for the united states but then it's trafficked to the mexican state and they do not anything to prevent this and how do governments know that these weapons come from the united states well due to the serial number traceability is key here by means of tracing weapons, we're able to know where they come from when they are in, when they are seized, for example, we can trace where they, where those were manufactured, who purchased it, on which date and the route of distribution. With that information, the companies that manufacture and distribute weapons could monitor their sales points and if they were diligent if they were careful or responsible they could say to their to the dealers well you have sold this amount of weapons and these weapons are part of a criminal organization in Mexico I will stop distributing weapons to you or or I will do something so that you do not continue being this irresponsible what could the state do well well the government of mexico controls who can uh, who can have a permit or a license to possess a weapon the restriction of the caliber that each citizen may possess and a monitoring monitoring effort in conjunction with states where from which weapons are imported to trace those weapons. What could a legal market do? Well, do risk assessment. Companies should conduct risk, assess risk assessment. If in Mexico, this sort of military weapons is forbidden, if Mexico really bans or restricts weapons, well, maybe uh, my shops my weapon shops should not be as close to the border if i know that each that a certain shop has sold these weapons that have ended up in the hands of criminal organizations they should stop engaging in those trading efforts but apparently the weapon industry in the united states instead of doing a risk assessment and contributing that they're to 
to ensure that their products do not impact in the most valuable human right, which is the right to life, they continue having a, a, have an income from that activities. So due diligence on the part of the industry and the weapon industry is very important in order to solve the situation, which as Commissioner Clark is something that also happens in countries in the Caribbean. It also happens in Canada, where there is an illegal trade of weapons very much expanded. So there is legal trade of weapons on the one hand on in where challenges must be overcome by uh, engaging in transparency. And then we have, on the other hand, the other issue, which should require a specific report on the part of the commission, which is the illicit trade and its impact on the enjoyment of human rights in the region. That trade creates armed violence and that violence creates migration, illegal migration as well. This weapons empower criminals who create profit from those persons that want to migrate to the United States. Now, as regards the murder of journalists, of course, this is alarming as the increase of femicides is alarming in my country. If if such an amount of weapons didn't exist here, surely the Mexican state would be in a much, in a better condition to respond to these situations. As I said before, when we speak about militarization of the Mexican state, we must reflect upon the fact that first, we must take the firepower from the crime, from the organized crime in Mexico so that the government can better respond to uh, crimes that affect civil citizens. Let me suggest to the commission that as regards human rights and businesses, we should think as of how the weapon industry, particularly in the United States, which is the biggest manufacturer in our region, how could they self-regulate? How could they self-discipline? How could they contribute to the fact that their products do not cause damage? Legally, weapon trade in the United States is targeted at self-defense, personal defense, or luxury activities, hunting, for example. The weapons that are traded in the United States, even if we can criticize that those weapons are military in nature and they are very much damaging and, dis and destructive that should only be in the hands of trained persons, well, those are legally traded. If this market exists, this market should be transparent and should hold people accountable. And that leads me to the last point, access to, to the justice. There is a domestic law in the United States that grants immunity to weapons industry against civil, uh, civil suits for damages. This, this is a mechanism for a weapon businesses to be held accountable. If they don't do this voluntarily, they should do it by order of a court. But as if we have seen from our latest complaint, there are illegitimate actions as presented by the Mexican state as a victim of this weapon trade. And this is not uh, had a positive result. So I thank the commission once again for their interest in such a sensitive topic. Thank you very much. We thank the Mexican state for its comment and we will go to the last part of this hearing. We go once again with a round of participations in the same order, but now we have only two minutes each so that, they, so that each person can 
present their final comments. So I give the floor first to the representative of the state of Bolivia for two minutes. Thank you very much and thank you for such an enriching and important debate today. Uh, in order to answer some of the comments by the commissioners, Commissioner Resemena said before, what are the states doing with regard to this? What's the standards that are being implemented? Well, in the case of Bolivia, we have a very accurate legislation as regards the regulation of the possession and use of weapons, law number 300, which establishes that the monopoly of this is on the hands of the state. No one can trade weapons without a specific purpose. However, despite having this regulation, such an accurate regulation, there is an illegal trade of weapons in our country. And this is what calls our attention in this hearing. While states have uh, different legislations, some states do control this issue. However, there is an illicit trade of weapons, of weapons that are used in crimes and against the most vulnerable sectors of our society. This is where we must delve deeper into. We believe that despite uh, making efforts to regulate this, there are still forms through which companies uh, become uh, impugned or they are able to trade these weapons without any coordination on the part of the states. This is why we speak of negligence and of the need to have a due monitoring of the part of the states. Also, we believe that it's very important that this is regulated at a regional level, at the hemisphere level. There, there are initiatives if, at the United Nations levels, and, and that could be very useful for this issue, such a concerning issue right now. Thank you very much. For your comments, I give the floor to the representative of the state of Paraguay for two minutes. Thank you. Well, um, I wanted to point out that it's very important to my country to hear different positions and approaches. And also we share the concern of the Mexican state in relation with this situation that affects all of us. As I said before, I spoke about our law. We are uh, relatively organized in our country. However, controls are never enough. So in order to briefly mention uh, some of the pending tasks that we have, we are implementing some of those, but to list some of the pending issues, I would like to first mention, as the Mexican representative said, that there's this problem in which some countries have a sort of monopoly as regards weapons and its manufacturing and management, as we said before, also corruption and institutional weakness, the lack of regulation in some cases, the need to exchange information between states and a cooperation that is still insufficient and maybe a part of the solution would be to look for a way to continue strengthening controls through other instruments of uh, a multi-agency effort. I'm sure I'm not saying anything new, but I wanted to contribute to reflection and to maybe distribute uh, tasks in the future. That would be all. Thank you. I give the floor now to Jonathan Lowy of Global Action. You have the floor. Thank you. I want to address a few questions. The one, there are a number of very simple things that the United States could and should do that would prevent uh, gun trafficking. Uh, one is to simply require dealers to use safe sales practices, to screen for straw purchases, to not engage in these very large transactions that supply the cartels in Mexico and also supply criminals in the U.S. 
products and throughout the region, and also to require manufacturers to only supply dealers who use safe sales practices and to revoke the licenses of dealers who use unsafe sales practices and violate the law. Unfortunately, the U.S. allows dealers to maintain their license in many cases where they're shown to illegally sell guns. The industry has refused to do any of these things. And to Commissioner Clark's point, that is, in my view, not just negligent, but reckless. And in fact, in my view, view, it is criminal. It is aiding and abetting the illegal trafficking of guns and illegal gun uh, possession. However, under U.S. law, in particular PLACA, the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, the, the gun industry, according to a number of courts, has immunity to engage in this reckless conduct that supplies criminal market and enables them to profit off the criminal trade without any accountability or liability. Uh, and that is what happened in the dismissal of Mexico's first lawsuit. To be clear, we believe that decision was incorrect and it should be reversed for a number of reasons. However, without PLACA, that case, there would be no basis to dismiss that case and we would be in discovery seeking accountability. So uh, that industry protection is a key part of the problem uh, that would prevent a lot of gun trafficking from the US. Muchas gracias y por los comentarios. Thank you very much for your comments. I give the floor now to Leon Castellanos of the Azar Institute for two minutes. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, picking up this line on uh, access to different uh, uh, resources and the impossibility to present appeals in the face of uh, companies that are immune I also wanted to highlight this. Here in Europe, we see the same problem. When we see weapon companies that are not punished because there is a community legislation related to licenses to export weapons that sometimes is not incorporated in the internal legal system. So in this region, when these regulations are not incorporated, which is the common Act of 2008, there are no mechanisms in the European community to make the decisions of uh, the countries that export weapons transparent. So we see this the case of the United States replicated here. When there is no transparency or accountability on the exportation of weapons, companies themselves no, don't need it, don't see the need to self-regulate. I'll give us an example. In Paris, they do not consider themselves competent, uh, the court of Paris, I mean, because the acts are part of a gov government decision. That is, the government had to intervene to prevent the exportation. So this is why the court says this is not a legal case where they hold any competence or jurisdiction to hear the situation of this victim. So the regulatory framework is very important in this sort of situations that create impunity and of course immunity. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. I give the floor now to John Lindsay Poland of, of the Stop Arms. Uh, Negligence posed by Commissioner Clark. I think it's because, well, we're not talking about selling lemonade. We're talking about access to mortal weapons that are designed for military use. Um, they're easy for civilians to acquire and they're pervasive in the United States. And that requires both due diligence and an end to negligence. The prior hearing on militarization demonstrated that the indiscriminate arming of state forces in Mexico has reinforced human rights violations and impunity. Uh, this commission addresses violations in states that do not hold perpetrators responsible from the state. Here we are also addressing ways that state forces have committed massacres and forced disappearances and receive more weapons because of a lack of best practices for weapons exports, such as those practices in Germany that, that Alejandro mentioned. In this lack of best practices, there's a collusion between weapons exporters, 
the Mexican army that controls all weapons imports and sales within Mexico and the US government. We concur with Mexico that the US government and the companies are the elephants that are not in the room today. Exporting countries, including the United States, Brazil, and other states in the hemisphere could and should require that weapons exporters, one, identify the true end users at the moment of licensing exports, and two, prohibit exports to entities that are implicated in serious violations or collusion with organized crime. So we request that the commission make a recommendation that re member states implement such requirements and are uh, ready to work with you in that, uh, in that effort. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Now we will give the floor to uh, Bruno Dangiani from Conectas Brasil. Uh, I just w wanted to do like two remarks. Uh, first of it, uh, I would like to like mention the difference between the situation in Mexico and Brazil. If it's true that Brazil uh, still suffers from mostly from domestic uh, firearms and uh, we are advocating also best practices uh, to our manufacturers, our domestic manufacturers. It is also true that when it comes to foreign weapons, we are dealing with the most problematic weapons. So assault rifles, machine guns, submachine guns that are frequently coming uh, from the US, either in the same way they are flowing to Mexico by like straw or chaser that I are buying these weapons and then trafficking to Brazil uh, or direct trafficking uh, to Brazilian borders uh, by air or by sea or legal export made to uh, our neighbors and then trafficked to, to the organized crime uh, you know, gangs. Um, and I just wanted also to offer uh, the report we have mentioned produced by Instituto Soda Paz that highlights uh, violations with firearms, but also brings profiling of firearms seized in Brazil uh, by type of weapons, by country of origin. So if this interests uh, any state party, we are more than happy to share with the Secretariat and, and make it uh, uh, to be received uh, by all the state parties. Thank you very much for the opportunity and also uh, thank you for the initiative. Muchas gracias. Agradecemos thank, thank you very much. We appreciate all your comments. Finally, I will give the floor to uh, Ms. Montserrat Martinez Treyes. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, well, considering um, the uh, practices that we have mentioned, uh, I think it's important to sustain good practices that promote the participation of the civil society as monitors on the impact and the importance of addressing the uh, inflow of the trafficking that comes to Mexico. For example, the uh, lawsuit that was filed by Mexico in Massachusetts, but also focusing on uh, the um, operations of Mexico with uh, private companies and the civil society. So it is important to act on proactive transparency to bring forth accountability. That is why the review of uh, the uh, private activities at uh, the local parliaments allows for uh, an open process that lets us know how the operations are held. And these precedents could be, uh, mitigate risks and even allow for reparations when the standards of due diligence are not met. And it is because of all of this that we would like to point out that uh, we would like to work with the commission and importing and exporting companies to discuss uh, the entire situation, considering considerations for uh, national security due diligence, and due diligence for human rights, working with um, businesses that uh, and with the civil society as well. Thank you, com uh, Commission, for this opportunity. 
Thank you again for the comments. We have um, now finalized all the stages of the hearing. Before closing this, I would like to thank the state of Mexico for having requested this hearing and the representatives of the uh, states of Bolivia, Paraguay, and the uh, organizations from the civil society that were here as well. I think that we have seen a very interesting approach on an issue that even though the commission had already covered in a more general manner in its report on private companies and human rights, the um, details of this phenomenon that we are seeing makes the commission focus its attention on uh, technical comments so they can be addressed within the framework of our jurisdiction. And we will probably be following up on this based on the ideas you have mentioned here today. There was a representative from the civil society from Conectas Brazil who mentioned that uh, they could send the uh, secretariat a study they have prepared. We would like to thank you um, and we would welcome this information. But I would also like to invite everyone here today. Uh, actually, I would like to ask you, because if you have any more information or reports, because sometimes because of the time we have at the hearings, we don't have the time to uh, go over all of the information, but we would really appreciate it if you could send us whatever information you can add to what was presented at the hearing today. We would really appreciate that. It would be very useful for the commission. I would like to finally thank you all for being here. For being here. It has been a true pleasure and this session is closed. Thank you very much. Salud, gracias. Yes. Thank you.